The 117th Congress counts just 91 veterans, the lowest number since at least World War II. It continues a trend that started in the early 1970s. Among those veterans is Congressman Ruben Gallego. His new book chronicles his life and experiences as a combat Marine. The book is titled They Called Us Lucky, which chronicles his unit and the steep price many American service members paid overseas. Congressman Gallego is the child of immigrants, raised by a single mother near Chicago. He eventually graduated from Harvard University. He went from the battlefield in Washington and currently serves in the House of Representatives. And Congressman Ruben Gallego joins us now. He's a Democrat who represents Arizona's 7th Congressional District, covering much of Phoenix. Congressman Gallego, thanks for joining us on this Veterans Day. Thank you for having me. So, Regarding your book, why did you feel that you wanted to go ahead and open up about your time serving in Iraq? And why did you feel that now was the time to do that? Well, I didn't want to open up and I didn't want to actually write this book. Um, this book was extremely painful for me to write and to even talk about. And even now that I have written the book, even talking about the book is still painful. The reason I, I finally wrote the book is because I went and sought help. Uh, you know, sought help with my PTSD and was finally in the mental state to actually be able to do it. And um, my friends, uh, the guys from Lima Company, the guys that, you know, took the most hits of the Iraq war and, and probably since uh, the Beirut bombing also asked me to do it. And I felt that especially with the privilege of being a member of Congress comes the responsibility and I needed to step up because it's been 15 years and some of us are already starting to die. Two of, two of the main characters in this book died in the process of writing this book. And I thought a lot of us were about to get forgotten. So I decided to step up, found a great uh, co-author in uh, Jim Delfis, Delfis and um, uh, you know, I've been able to write, was able to write this book. And, and, and the book is about them. It's really not a book about me. Well, tell us about your unit, Lima Company, and why you think it serves as a microcosm of America. Because it is a microcosm of America. It, it, it grabbed men from Albuquerque in Arizona, uh, I mean, New Mexico and Arizona, Latinos, Native Americans, and put them together with African Americans and and Anglo's from Ohio. I mean, we were the we were some of the first people to introduce these Ohio boys to the concept of tortillas and green chili, for example. <laughs> uh, and you know, we became like close close brothers. I still talk to these men. Uh, I still you know care about them. They care about me. And and uh, you know, in the span of six months, we became so close. Uh, and unfortunately, we lost so many people. Uh, also, and it shows that you know sacrifice really has no barrier in the United States, no color barrier. Uh, everybody was there, and you, you can see my friends right there in this last picture. That's uh, Gibber Mieta from uh, uh, Northern New Mexico, Taos. That's myself, uh, my best friend Jonathan Grant from Pohake, and then John Bailone from the Navajo Nation. Uh, so that's a good example of who's fighting this this war right now, uh, and it's the best of America, and it's the best men I've ever I've ever encountered. I want to ask you more about them in just a moment. But while we have you, Congressman, um, I do want to uh, talk about the war in Afghanistan, because as you know, President Biden has been criticized over the withdrawal. I wonder what your thoughts are on the war there as a whole, how it ended and what is happening there now? Well, the war as a whole, it should have ended a long time ago. You know, we our goal was to uh, displace uh, you know, Al Qaeda and to capture Osama bin Laden. When we did both of those, we should have left. Uh, the idea and content of nation building is extremely difficult to do. Uh, and after 20 years, there was no success coming. And, you know, all we heard from generals and the Pentagon over and over again, it's like, you know, success is around the corner, success is around the corner. Well, look, there's no way success is around the corner if the government of Afghanistan falls within just three weeks. Uh, and I'm glad that we left. I wish we could have gone in a more organized manner. I do think that's something that is a valid criticism. Uh, but at the end of the day, we had to leave there. The Afghanistan government was not going to stand for itself. We couldn't create the government for them. We wouldn't be able to put more men and more lives at risk for something that just wasn't going to happen. And for the men that served there in Afghanistan, you didn't fail Afghanistan. You know, you survived the war. You helped your men stay alive, your women stay alive. At the end of the day, it was the politicians and the generals that failed us. And we're only, this is the perspective I try to put in the book, you know, we're only... Uh, especially enlisted men, we're just, you know, a cog in the machinery. We've got to do our best. And, and part of that is just staying alive. Let's turn to January 6th. You were on the House floor in the middle of that assault. How have the events of that day defined what has happened in Congress since then? 
Look, I think it's been a, the Congress has become a little more acidic since then. People are are on short tempered, and a lot of us feel that we've been betrayed by our colleagues. You know, and we know what happened there. We saw insurrectionists breaking through these doors. We knew that they were assaulting our police officers on Capitol Hill, and the fact that these, um, you know, our colleagues, our, our Republican colleagues specifically, are denying January 6 even occurred, or saying it was done by some other people. Um, that it wasn't, it wasn't actually insurrection. It was a, you know, a patriotic movement. I mean, all these types of excuses when we know it was a true attempt at insurrection. That's what I think saddens uh, a lot of us and really makes us angry with some of our colleagues. We do respect them, but you know, this is the one area that they they seem to not worry about, where, you know, democracy is at stake. Um, you know, for me, it's very personal. I'm the son of immigrants. I love this country. It's why I served in the military. Uh, and to think that we came this close to being overthrown uh, for somebody like Donald Trump, I mean, for anybody, for that matter, um, it's, it's, a, it's a sad statement. And uh, it, it hurts. It hurts every day we go in there. We see the people that are, are basically trying to foment that uh, insurrection again. Um, I want to ask you as well about what's happening in Arizona. You're a progressive Democrat in what's historically been a conservative state. A number of left-leaning groups dissatisfied with Senator Kirsten Sinema would like to see you mount a primary challenge. Do you see merit with the left's frustration with Senator Sinema? It's not a frustration with the left. I think the, the merit is with the, the constituents of Arizona, is, and I've heard this all the time, is that she's not communicating with her constituents. And I think it's incumbent upon her to talk to her constituents. And even if they disagree uh, about what the direction that Congress should be going, I think at minimum that constant communication is important. So this is not a left-right issue. This is a um, you know constituent uh, complaint in general. And look, it's tough uh, being out there right now. It's tough coming off COVID and being out there right now. I'm still trying to gear up and get back into the swing of town halls and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, this fight is not between left or right. It's between people feeling frustrated that government and their elected officials aren't listening to them. I wonder, have you spoken with Senator Sinema directly about her hesitations over the reconciliation bill? Uh, I haven't, and many other uh, Arizona uh, members of Congress have not. Uh, I think she keeps counsel to herself. And again, there's actually nothing wrong with that. I mean, every politician has a different decision-making process. But at the same time, we have to answer to our constituents, at least talk to them. And if you disagree, then you disagree and you, you know, and, and you have to go on to what you want. But the process that, that she's using right now, I think, is actually very detrimental to her. Finally, Congressman, on this Veterans Day, what are your reflections and what is it that your fellow members of Lima Company taught you about service in this country? Look, my reflection is that I got to serve my country with the best men that this country have ever produced. Men that love their country, love their families, and just wanted to go back. And, um, you know, they gave the ultimate sacrifice. And, you know, the, my, the Linda Lima Company taught me true patriotism and what it means to be, uh, you know, a good American. Uh, and I'll never, ever forget that lesson. Um, the brotherhood that we have is, it, it, I can't even describe it. And I hope that this book, uh, that I wrote for them will we'll do it, do this this company justice because we did so much, fought so much, and then even came home and you know many of us barely are, are surviving mentally, physically, and spiritually um, for this country. And um, you know I I feel for them and I, I want I want this to be successful for them because we've done everything we could for this country and and we would again if if given uh, if if asked to do it again. Congressman Ruben Gallego, thank you very much for joining us, and thank you for choosing to serve. Thank you. It's my pleasure. It really was my pleasure.